that's available to them where there are no, they're not being preyed upon. So in those environments, they're, they're, of, they're of no value. And so we may as well just get rid of them if we can. But in natural systems, just, just leave it alone. So we have, we have Aedes aegypti and Quinquefaciatus and Saba, right? Those are mosquitoes that are feeding on people. Then you have those other few species that are not feeding on people. They're part of the ecosystem in Saba. So just leave them alone. You know, and, and before we interfered, mosquitoes did help in population suppression of certain birds and animal species to stop them becoming dominant. You know, like we see these images of wildebeest by their thousands in Serengeti. You can't just allow those wildebeest to increase and increase and increase and increase to a point where they become so dominant they eat the grass for all the other animals. And so mosquitoes that were around were transmitting diseases that kept wildebeest populations at a certain level. So in the natural systems, diseases did play a role in maintaining a balance. But, but humans were not natural and we're stuffing everything up. No, it's, it's, it's mostly because they're just feeding the larvae, yeah. But you have to continuously introduce guppies into the cisterns because they're not surviving in the cisterns. It's dark, and they've eaten all the mosquitoes, and then they start, and they die. So that's why the vector control program has to periodically visit almost every cistern and introduce guppies. Yeah. 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 Only females take blood. Males don't lay eggs, right. so they don't need blood. Okay. Hope you're not all tired of mosquitoes already. <laughs> carry on a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about this mosquito, Aedes aegypti. I'm going to give you a bit of natural history, a um, bit of evolution, not as far back as Anton has gone, a bit more recent evolution of this species. Um, and I'm going to share with you some of the recent work our lab's been doing to look at the genetic makeup of this species across the Dutch Caribbean and uh, think a little bit about what that might mean for mosquito control here. Right, let's dive in. Whoop. There we go. Here's our species. You've seen her a few times tonight. It is Egypti. She's easily recognized by this banding pattern on her legs. On her thorax, she has uh, two stripes and what's called a, a lyre shape. You've probably seen her around even tonight. <laughs> Um, half the world's population are at risk of infection with a disease vectored by this mosquito. So she is really, really dangerous. And I'm going to be explaining how she got this dangerous, why she's this dangerous tonight. So where did she come from? She's highly invasive. And we think um, originated from the forests of Southern Africa, or Sub-Saharan Africa, I should say. So today we find two species um, living in these forests, two subspecies of Aedes aegypti. The one on your left up here, the darker one, we think is the ancestral form of Aedes aegypti, Aedes aegypti formosus. And she lives in the forest, lays her eggs in tree holes, and feeds mainly on animals. So primates usually and uh, doesn't really bother people that much. You'll go into the forest, you'll see them and 
about 400, 500 years ago, something really important happened with this mosquito, and it started to move to become a little more domesticated. So now this mosquito, no, I'm pointing at the wrong thing, aren't I? Let me, oh, there we go. No. Right, okay, right. So what this mosquito is doing now is breeding in man-made containers. So people keep water in these clay pots, for example, and that's where these are now laying the eggs, no longer in tree holes in the forest. Also, they've changed their feeding behavior. They now prefer human blood over animal blood. Oh, animal. We're animals too, right? But primates in the forest. Um, so these adaptations have allowed this species to spread and become so dangerous. So we have here a species of mosquito that has moved out of the forests of Africa and spread around the world. We have a primate, us, that has evolved from the primates that used to live in these forests. We've spread out of Africa around the world. And the four most important um, diseases that these mosquitoes vector, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, and yellow fever, also thought to originate in these forests. So these mosquitoes are adapted to transmit these diseases to us or other primates, right? That's why they're so dangerous. So following the history of this, the next big disease that these are likely to transmit, the next big epidemic is probably also a virus that's going to come out of these forests and spread around the world. Are there any more viruses there? Well, the Rockefeller Foundation has about 4,000 um, virus isolates from mosquitoes the majority of which are of African origin in their collections. So four really is the tip of the iceberg. Um, I don't know if anybody here has heard about the Magyaro virus. It's sporadically, is my mic okay? Yes. All right. Um, it's been popping up um, in South America. It has a sylvatic cycle at the moment, so mainly transmitted in the forest by a group of mosquitoes mosquitoes called Hemagogus mosquitoes. Um, so it's circling in monkeys in the forest, but every now and again we've seen incidents of it pop up in people over the last few years. And we've isolated it from Aedes aegypti recently. You know, so now we know um, it's in South America, but we think that this virus also has its origin in Africa and has just been waiting in South American forests. So will this be the next big thing to come out, we just don't know, but we are seeing evidence of it appearing. Still pointing at the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Do viruses originate in the mosquito or is it transferred from the primate, for instance? So, like, why are some viruses do really well versus, like, an HIV doesn't transmit mosquito? Oh, why do, yeah. So, a virus, yes, would have to be adapted to um, replicate inside a mosquito. Not not all viruses are vectored by a by an insect. Yeah. Um, right. So how did this spread around the world? It originated in Africa, like I've been saying. And as you heard from Anton, another really really important factor is these eggs that Aedes aegypti can lay. They're desiccation resistant. They can last several months so they can travel, right? If something like this gets on board a ship, it can easily cross the Atlantic. And that's exactly what happened. In the 16th century, we have the transatlantic slave trade. Mosquitoes get on board and cross the Atlantic to the New World. So about 70% of early slave trade was conducted by Portugal, so our best guess is maybe the first Aedes aegypti came from Angola, but we're not entirely sure. Um, closely on its heels, dengue and yellow fever outbreaks in the Americas. Now the transatlantic trade was triangular in nature, so ships left Europe, they sailed down the coast to Africa, 
loaded their human cargo, crossed the Atlantic, and from there, stocked up on goods from the New World, headed back to Europe. So, Mosquito on board, and entered the Mediterranean in the 1800s, followed by dengue and yellow fever outbreaks all around the Med. From here, 1969, oh sorry, 1869, 100 years earlier, <laughs> the Suez Canal opens and allows passage for Aedes aegypti through here. And you've guessed it, this time chikungunya, an urban dengue fever across Asia. Now, Asia had dengue fever already, but in a sylvatic cycle, so they didn't have so much spillover. It was mainly circulated in forests. But once this really domestic mosquito arrived, you saw these large urban outbreaks. From there, it's really just a short little hop across, isn't it, to Australia, 1887, the first Aedes aegypti collected in Brisbane, and 10 years later, dengue fever as well. So what's the situation today? We have Aedes aegypti in most tropical and subtropical regions around the world. And as you heard from Anton, also spreading into not so tropical regions. We have it in California, which is extremely dry. So it's starting to adapt to different climates as well. And the dots you see on my map here, those are just recorded instances of um, Egypti, so a blank space doesn't necessarily mean there's no mosquito there. So what does this mean for Saba? Um, we've been working on the genetics of mosquitoes. And uh, the first thing when you're trying to control a population is you need to know, is that population isolated? You if you have a lot of emigration and immigration into your system, then it's no good trying to set up a control program because you're just like trying to put out a fire, right? You're getting more and more in. And so if you have an isolated population, you can actually start to think about controlling it. How do we go about that? This is what our lab does. We go out, we collect mosquitoes or have friendly vector control send us mosquitoes. And then we extract the DNA. We sequence their whole genomes. Um, this is really fairly new technology that we can so easily um, sequence an entire genome from a species for, um, so when we sequence one mosquito, it's about one, one and a half grand, right? No, I mean cost dollars, right? One yeah, one and a half thousand dollars to sequence an entire mosquito's genome. Um, then what you do is you align your genome to what we call a reference genome, which is the standard Aedes aegypti genome. And then you can start comparing genetic differences between your individuals, right? So you look at the genetic code and you see you know, does my, whoop, where's my, oops, sorry. Does my mosquito have an A, does it have a G? And each individual will be different, and this is how we can tell how closely populations are related. Um, these are incredibly complex and big data sets that need some bioinformatics skill to analyze, so then you can produce nice graphs like this one. <laughs> I'll talk a little in detail about the steps. So for our project here, we collected from, or um, vector control collected for us, mosquitoes from St. Martin, St. Eustatius, and Sava, here you are. We also collected from other locations around the world um, because it's nice to have outgroups that we and an analysis like this, so you can see how related Caribbean mosquitoes are to other mosquitoes in the world. We have mosquitoes from California, the Keys, from Mexico, um, South Africa. 
This is how we usually collect mosquitoes. We have two kind of traps we like to use. This one on this side is called a BG Sentinel trap, and it, it mimics a host, so it'll attract mosquitoes looking to bite a host usually. Um, this one here is called an OV trap. It'll attract females looking for somewhere to lay eggs. There's me in the field. <laughs> There's me in the lab. <laughs> um, extracting the DNA at this stage. And then, so we extract the DNA in our lab, and then we send it to, this is the UC Davis Sequencing Center, and they sequence the genome for us. And then we end up with a, a big data file for processing on our computers back in the lab. And we can make pretty graphs like this. So what you're looking here at here is um, the results of a principal components analysis that we carried out on the mosquitoes collected from these islands. Uh, principal component analysis is a really nice way of, of looking at, at um, large patterns in big data sets. So what it does, it, it basically it groups things that are similar, in our case, mosquitoes that are genetically similar. So each, each point you see on my graph, each circle, each square, is an individual mosquito that we've sequenced. And if we go through it, so we're going to start with the one on our left here. I hope. Yeah, there we go. These are our South African samples grouping up in the corner here. We have in blue samples collected from Northern California. In pink and red, we have samples from Southern California and they group, so that means they're closely related to samples from Florida and Mexico in that corner. And then over there in green, that's us here in the Caribbean. The graph on your right is just looking at these Caribbean islands. Same thing, each dot is a mosquito. We have our mosquitoes collected from Puerto Rico, all grouping together nicely up here. We have our mosquitoes from St. Eustatius grouping quite tightly here. St. Martin and Sava down here. A little more spread in these samples. That means they're covering a little more genetic space. There's a little more variation, mainly due to this little mosquito that looks like it's a bit more closely related to our Puerto Rican mosquitoes, but still, you can see these islands, like a pattern like this means you really have fairly good isolation between islands, but you possibly have sporadic introductions. So they're not, they're not completely isolated, but to be honest, just for, for islands that are this close together, this pattern is really as good as it gets, <laughs> I think. So what does it mean for control? I'm going to leave you with good news. It's, it's good for control efforts because, like I said, an isolated population is going to be far easier to control than a population that has a lot of immigration into it. Um, the way you control it is obviously would need a lot more. So this is, I would say, the beginning this is the first step in a control program. From here, you need to run a lot more data to decide actually how you would go about this. But the point is, you can go about this. Oh. <laughs> Next. I don't know. All mosquito questions have been answered. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So yeah. how, how far does the mosquito fly? It's only transported from the larva stages, or can one yeah. fly over from island to island? Depends on species. species. This one tends to hang about its larval site. It'll probably fly between 50 to 100 meters, I would say, on average. But if it 
Like there's been instances where wind can carry mosquitoes much further. These like to hitchhike in cars, so that'll, you know, transport it a lot further. that's coming in from St. Martin is treated? Yeah. I don't think it is. No. Thank you, Anton and Erka. Can we give them both another round of applause? Fascinating, <laughs> very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for coming out. Hopefully not too many of you were bitten in the process. Thank you to our Facebook audience. Sorry about the disturbance before, but internet on Seba is a little touch and go. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors, particularly Hummingbird Villa for accommodating our experts. Thank you to Carib Trans. And also, thank you for Hideaway for accommodating us for this presentation. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> you are more than welcome to stay for drinks, food, anything afterwards at Hideaway. If you have more questions for our experts, please let them know. A few upcoming events that we have. Tomorrow, our mosquito experts have a field project. I've heard it's a scavenger hunt. So it actually sounds very interesting, so you should all stop by the tent, sign up. Would you like to say something, Anton? Um, if you plan on attending the hike, please bring flashlights. And then on Saturday, we have our next presentation by our sponge expert, uh, Joseph Pollock, at 5.30 p.m. at Lollipops. They're way in the back if you would like to <laughs> talk to them early. And then you can also join Joe on a dive for a sponge survey on Sunday, October 6th at 1 p.m. Thanks again for coming and have a wonderful night. Miami is known as an international community and the hub of trade and logistics for the Caribbean and Americas. A leader in the freight logistics industry, Carib has served the Caribbean region for more than 30 years, with a footprint that has grown from one island to now serving the majority, as well as Central and South America. Carib Trans is an NVOCC, a non-vessel operating common carrier, meaning it has the same responsibilities as a shipper without owning the vessels or planes. Its primary customers, individuals who ship clothing, electronics, and other personal items, and occasionally cars. Most of the stuff that they're sending is because they, they don't get it there. So for us to provide it on two services, air and ocean, we can give them a choice of how fast you want it. So if you ran, want it really fast, we're going to send it by air, you're going to have it next day, sometimes even the same day. That on-time service has been the key to carry trend success, whether shipping by air or by sea. The company moves about 5,000 TEUs of freight each year, more than any NWCC in the region. And since it joined the Sachuk family of transportation companies a couple of years ago, Carib Trans can offer customers even more shipping options. Other NVOCCs, they depend on other uh, shipping lines that are not part of their family. So they need to rely on whether they're going to sell or not, whether, whether they are late or not. It doesn't happen to us because it's part of our family of, uh, of companies. We, we control the service that we give. Sí, buenos días, por favor, con Diana. Quality service is what keeps customers coming back. 
customers are treated like family, and when they leave to research competitors, it doesn't usually last long. They have left and they have come back because they've said that, you know, nobody does it better <laughs> than current trends. So because of that relationship. That exceptional service includes consolidation. Customers can have freight sent here and store for free for up to a month, then consolidate it and